hope for tomorrow. It's what I call a divine intersection. When the will of man and the will of God just happen to meet at the same place at the same time. The clouds will pass away, the darkness turns into light, and the tears cease, and joy comes in the morning. Angels are guarding your destiny tonight, and you have no idea how long they've been on guard. Hope for tomorrow with Reverend Jeffrey Njenga. Today, I want us to consider joy. So, what is this thing, joy? Joy is a noun word. A dictionary definition of the word joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness, that state of inner sense of wellness. It's from the word joy that we derive the word rejoice. Joy or rejoicing is about inner contentment no matter the obtaining reality, even of adversity and pain. Joy in the scripture is much more than happiness, yes? Joy really has nothing to do with the outward appearance or reality. As a matter of fact, you can have joy or rejoice in your heart when the outward reality is harsh and brutal because joy wells from the inside. Joy or rejoicing is much more than happiness. Happiness is an emotional reaction that is often determined by some outside stimulus. Happiness is about feelings. So happiness is an outward expression of pleasure because you feel good, but joy comes in spite of the outward circumstances. This means that you can have inner wellness and contentment even when everything around you is wrong and growing worse. Joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5:22, we see the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. And there you have it. Joy is the work or the product of the Spirit of God in the life of a believer. This means that joy is produced in the life of a Christian by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. To grow in joy, therefore, you need to allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in your life. In many places, the Bible talks about the reality of suffering, and the scriptures tell Christians to expect suffering. In his letters, St. Peter encouraged the believers who are going through heavy-duty suffering not to be dismayed or surprised about the suffering they were going through, but rather to accept it and look out for the purpose or the reason God was allowing it. Peter told them to persevere. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And again, no less than our Lord Jesus Christ himself pro- promises that the true believer in God will experience suffering and pain. He himself went through horrendous suffering. No doubt suffering has many benefits for the believer in God. God is doing some work in you through your suffering and through your pain. St. Peter tells you and I to persevere as God does his work in us through the pain. Yes, suffering is not a sadistic scheme by the Almighty God. Our God is at work to make you better and not bitter even through your pain. But what does Apostle Paul say about suffering? Paul goes beyond persevering the reality of suffering and pain and tells you who may be going through the discomfort or pain to do something that at first may sound strange and even absurd to some of us. Paul tells you to rejoice. Really? To have that inner reality of wellness that overrides anything and everything that obtains. He says there in Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Yes, rejoice, rejoice. Your calling is to rejoice, my friend, not some of the time, not when everything is jolly and hearty, but always. And always means all the time to experience the exuberance of wellness even when chips are down. You've been knocked to the ground by the reality of life. This is also different from happiness, which is circumstantial. The apostle says unashamedly and without apology, and he repeats, I will repeat it again, rejoice. He even goes a notch higher while addressing another group of believers there in Thessalonica. They are in chapter 5 of First Thessalonians. Rejoice always. 
pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And take another look at that scripture. You are not only to rejoice always, all the time, but you are to give thanks in all circumstances. The accident, the pain, the breakups, the loss of the job, the persecution, the crazy boss you would like to throw under the bus, and even the political leadership that you hate and the failure of the business as well. He says something that can sound stunning in your current circumstances. He says that rejoicing is God's will concerning you. Amazing. What does St. Paul know about my situation, you may wonder? If only the apostle knows about my wife, he would not even suggest that I rejoice. She is the epic instrument of torture. If only Paul knew about my husband and that wretch of a boss that I have and the pain shooting in my body. If only Paul knows how of what you have been through, he would be a little careful, you think, with this thing about joy and rejoicing. Really? Not now, Paul, you may say, perhaps some other time. Friend, you are wrong. This is hope for tomorrow with me, Geoffrey Njenga. Today, thinking about joy and rejoicing. We are called to rejoice always. Stay with me. Hope for tomorrow with Reverend Jeffrey Njenga. So how is it possible to have joy in spite of the circumstances? This is so because the word of God is true. Yes, the word will stand when all else fail. The word says rejoice evermore and always regardless. Even when under intense pressure, even when your body is wasting away and your world has caved in. Rejoice always, my brother. Rejoice, my sister. What we need to appreciate is that the Apostle Paul is no stranger to pain and pressure and suffering. He suffered greatly for his faith in God. As a matter of fact, St. Paul wrote the letter we know as Philippians, well, chained to a Roman God. Yes, the man was in prison as he urged the believers in Philippi to rejoice. He wrote that letter to encourage the believers who are going through the pain of persecution. He wrote to encourage them not to be downcast, but to rejoice no matter their reality. Now, I don't know whether you've been in prison, but the fact of the matter is that prison is definitely not the place in which you rejoice. It is definitely out of gear for anyone to write letters of encouragement from prison to those in the outside world. But that is precisely what St. Paul is doing. Prison is a tough, rough place. You are held against your will. You spend time with strangers, most of them of questionable character. Prison is a place of scarcity. Your freedom is curtailed and you live on the basics of life. It's a most unlikely place to have a sense of wellness. Prison life, more often than not, destroys the individual. While in prison, your life is basically on hold. And uppermost in the mind of most prisoners is to serve the time and get out to begin living over again. There is nothing good about life in committee or any other prison anywhere else. Only a few people survive intact the prison life. But strange enough, the Apostle Paul found joy in prison and shared the same. And friend, you too can find joy in your prison today. Your prison may be physical jail. You are right now behind bars. And again, it may not be. Your prison may be your marriage. It's falling apart and you know it, but you feel trapped by the obligations. Your prison may be that job which you hate with a passion, but you don't see any way out. Your prison may be the extended family where everybody is fighting the other. You feel trapped by life itself. Where can you go? How can you rejoice? The theme of Paul's more letter, Philippians, is joy or to rejoice. Paul is calling on this church not just to persevere or tough things out, but to actually be glad and have a sense of wellness in spite of the prevailing circumstances. You can experience joy in the most unlikely place and under the most severe and extreme circumstances. Why? Because, friend, God is able to give the peace to your heart, the peace that you desperately need. Perhaps you know the story behind the popular hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It's also known as When Peace Like a River. We've just played it. Horatio G. Spafford was a successful lawyer and businessman in Chicago with a lovely family, a wife, Anna, and five children. 
he had invested a lot in real estate along Lake Michigan shoreline. But his world began to cave in when his son died at age four. Then in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed his vast business empire. In 1873, he planned a trip to London with his family. In November of that year, due to unexpected last-minute business demands, Horatio had to remain in Chicago, but he sent his wife and their four daughters ahead as scheduled in the sea. He expected to follow in a few days. On November 22nd, the ship collided with another vessel and it sank within 12 minutes. Several days later, the survivors were finally landed at Cardiff, Wales, and Anna cabled her husband saved alone. Spafford left the U.S. immediately to join his wife in Britain. While at sea, as the ship made progress to its destination, Spafford requested the captain to show him where the ship carrying his family is thought to have sunk. It's at that point that Spafford wrote the words of the popular hymn with a soothing refrain, It is well, it is well with my soul. And this wonderful hymn has provided comfort and hope and assurance to many a grieving heart. It can be well with your soul, my friend. Yes, it can be if you look to God under the most severe circumstances. Yes, indeed, you can find joy and peace of heart in the saddest moment of your life. God can do for you what no human being can. And perhaps you bear that testimony right now in your own reality. Everybody out there looks at you with pity and sympathy, but deep in your heart, you have bubbling joy. Friend, that is the work of the living God of heaven. For those who do not know, the big and natural question is, how can this be? How can you possibly find joy in the face of adverse and perhaps even tragic circumstances? Firstly, this joy is not the result of your great effort or energy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit, like we said earlier. There in Galatians 4.22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, and forbearance, and kindness, and goodness, and the others. Against such things there is no law. If you surrender to the Holy Spirit of God, then as natural as the tree produces the fruit of its kind, you will have joy in your heart as that Spirit produces the fruit in your heart. No struggle, no hassle. God will cause joy to well from deep in your heart as you wait upon him. I suppose you have not seen an orange tree or a banana tree struggling to produce the fruit of its kind. It does not scream or fret either. It sits there and in due season the fruit pops out and you too, friend, as you wait upon the Lord, joy which is a fruit of the Spirit will grow in your life. The super challenge is of course to sit still and wait for the Lord to do his work in you. We are more likely to fret and run around and even scream when things are not working, when we feel like we are in prison. But the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, yes, wait. God is at work. God is doing something good, something new, uh, something different and something else. God loves you, friend, and cares for you deeply. And he truly wants you to have joy. The apostle says something else in his small letter to encourage you and me. There in verse 6 of chapter 1, being confident of this, he says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What does this mean? Only this. God began a good work in you. This work began long time ago, even before the foundation of the world. Yes, God knew me even before the beginning of time. He created you and declared you good. He has a good plan for you. And this plan is on course no matter what prison you may find yourself in right now. And he will not stop until his objective is achieved. This prison you are going through will not change God's plan for you. And for that, and because of that truth, you and I can rejoice. Yes, we can have joy in our hearts. You see, I may not always see it or even feel it, but that is beside the point. God has committed himself to complete in me and in you the work that he began. God is definitely not like some of the contractors who start work only to leave it partially done. For whatever reason, uh, God changes not. He 
is in charge. And he will change those who believe in him from one glory to another here on earth. And this work will be completed when the Lord Jesus Christ will present you and me to God the Father at the conclusion of history as we know it. When Christ shall return to rule and to reign forever, no matter what you're going through right now, my friend, God is at work and he will complete the work he began in you. And for that, you can rejoice. This is hope for tomorrow with me, Geoffrey Njenga, today thinking about joy or rejoice in the life of a believer. Stay with me. Hope for tomorrow with Reverend Jeffrey Njenga. The understanding and the acceptance of that fact is a God in you to accomplish his work will fill your heart with joy unspeakable in the most unlikely place and in the face of severe situations. Rejoice my brother and my sister because everything that may happen to you is allowed by God to make you better. Nothing in this universe can stop the work that God has put in motion in your life. You will not only rejoice but can confidently thank God for all things not because pain gives you pleasure but because you know that God is at work regardless of the reality. Yes, you can rejoice. Again, once you accept that God is at work in your current uh, situation, your heart gains the freedom to explore why you are where you are right now, even in the prison. If God is at work in your life to accomplish his purpose in my life, there must be a reason why I am in my current situation. While chained to the prison guard, Paul could have chosen to whine and complain and even get bitter against the Roman authority. He had the choice to spend all his time sulking or complaining to the palace guard to whom he was chained. But being confident that God was at work even in this uncomfortable reality, Paul saw the opportunity and he grabbed the chance to share the message of salvation with the palace guard. You see, the guards were changed frequently and therefore the apostle had a steady supply of captive audience to hear the gospel. St. Paul rejoiced in his imprisonment because the experience put him in contact with the palace guards with whom he shared the good news. This then was his ministry field for now. These soldiers were the elite guards, uh, remember, who would surely take the message of salvation from Paul to spread to the higher hierarchy of the Roman rule. How else would the Roman elite hear of the message of salvation? What a privileged ministry. This is why Paul would say, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Two things here. Friend, your current difficulty must have a higher purpose for yourself, even though perhaps all that is not clear to you right now. And other people will be strengthened and encouraged as they see you standing firm in spite of the challenges. Recently, after I taught a class in mediation, a lady came to me and posed this question. How can I mediate between those who are having disputes? And I know I have unresolved the difficulties of my own. How? My answer to her was that God is not limited by our own circumstances and rules and has used anyone who would trust him. As a matter of fact, and just like in the life of Paul, God will use your own situation to advance the cause of Christ, but only if you're willing to trust and follow wherever he may lead. You see, more often than not, the problem is not God but your own feelings of inadequacy and self-condemnation and the bitter judgment by other people which keep you stuck in the past. You must free yourself and trust God to use you in whichever way he may lead. Stop condemning yourself, my friend. Stop listening to those who are putting you down. Move forth with confidence and trust God to use you no matter what may have happened to you. You see, some of you have lost all joy because you are faced with unfair competition. You can also rejoice in the face of unfair competition because those who may oppose you or take unfair advantage of you will surely not halt the cause of Christ in your life. Listen to Paul talking about false preachers of unfair competition. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love 
knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. At a time when the line between ministry and business and commerce is blurred and at times not there at all, those faithful servants of the Lord can be discouraged and even disillusioned and even lack joy. As you consider the vain competition among ministers in the scramble for money, prestige, and power, you can be tempted to give up. But friend emulates and poor. He saw the good in a bad situation. While he saw the activities of the opponent for what they were, evil, he refused to let that crush him. Why? Because the word of God was preached whatever the motive or reason. The word of God, friend, is preached. Paul knew about the power of the word of God. It is living and active, and it will do its work when released for whatever reason. The word does not return void, remember? So let those speakers and the preachers blare and speak the word. It does not return void. In ways you and I may never understand, the word will do its work, and for that we can rejoice. You see, Paul says nothing about the false preachers themselves, but the word of God is not silent about them. It says they are like wind without rain, and their punishment is real for misleading God's people. They can have the limelight now, but great punishment awaits them. You can therefore rejoice no matter what, my friend. These are enemies of the cross of Christ, and their destination is destruction. Their God is their stomachs, and Paul tells the church in Philippi. You can also rejoice in your humble circumstances because humility leads to exaltation. If you allow yourself to be put down now for the sake of Christ, God will lift you up in due time. Paul says there in the letter to the church in Philippi, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Look out to the interest of others. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Christ made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He was humbled and even killed, but God his Father did not abandon him. Therefore, Paul says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friend, you can therefore rejoice because after the time of being put down, after the time of being humiliated and all that which is designed to make you feel small and insignificant, God will lift you up. Yes, he will in due time. Just wait and see and keep rejoicing. This is Hope for Tomorrow with me, Geoffrey Njenga, today, encouraging us to rejoice always. Stay with me. Hope for Tomorrow with Reverend Geoffrey Njenga. Friend, you can rejoice if you live in hope as well. There is a sense in which people seem to have lost hope in these days. Many have lost hope in politics local or international, I sense little hope in honest business as well. And there's little enthusiasm in marriage life, especially among the youth. There's little hope there. There's little hope in interpersonal relationships either. These have been taken over by business considerations. But those who look up and wait on God can rejoice even in bleak situations. We can aim and hope for more if we keep our eyes on God. We must also learn to leave the past and learn to live today and refuse to be unduly worried about past failures. Listen to Apostle Paul there in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already obtained all these or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Friend, you may not have obtained what you hoped for. You may not have achieved your dreams. But one thing you must do is to press on with joy. To do this, you must put down the burden of guilt and regret and desire for revenge. These things will no doubt hold you back and make you miserable. Hating those who did you wrong will rob and drain you from your heart. Instead of joy, you will be miserable in your heart. 
One reason why we lose a sense of joy is we will not release the past and reach to the future. You probably continue to carry a heavy burden of all the wrongs people have done to you. You often bring those evil things back to memory. You probably enjoy meditating and talking about all what did not work for you. Every time you recall those things, the faces and the events are just like yesterday and the pain and anger are real over and over again. How then can you rejoice when you are virtually a prisoner of the past? This is very important, especially for women who are blessed with particularly fantastic memory. Everything that happened is filed neatly in their mind for easy recall. Well, good memory has great merit, but recalling everything that went wrong in 3D and dwelling on it is not helpful for someone who wants to release the bitter past and reach to the future. So what is a better option? The better option is to focus on the future. And Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting the past and reaching out to the future. This forgetting the past is about learning to forgive. Evaluate your past, my friend, and ask God to forgive you and forgive others and reach out to the future. It will be impossible to lift off to the future. If you are carrying the burden of pain and unbelief and unforgiveness, please let go of the past. What then should you meditate on? What should you allow to occupy your mind? By the way, did you know that what you allow to seize your mind determines how you feel? If you change your mind, God can change your heart. The scriptures tell us to meditate on the things of God. Joshua told the people he was leading, This word of the Lord shall not depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So if you want to rejoice, the word will give you the right perspective and calm your heart. If you will rejoice, you will need to focus on certain things. You know as a man thinketh, so is he. So if you want to influence your feelings and thereby rejoice, you must be careful how you think. In this day and age of instant communications, you can easily take in all the wrong things. You have endless messaging in the social media and the streaming of information from everywhere and the unceasing telephone calls. You can easily suffer information overload. You can clutter your mind with harmful things. You'll be told that everything is harmful and causing cancer. This makes us anxious. Paul says that if you change your thinking, you will no doubt rejoice. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true and noble and bright and pure and lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Philippians chapter 4, beginning from verse 8. Again, you will rejoice if you learn to be content. Greed is a god of the age. The grabbing mania holds strong. During an interview, the media man asked Rockefeller, the American billionaire, what it would take to satisfy the human heart. The rich man shot back just a little more. You want to grab just one more plot or get one more million and buy one more shoe or dress thinking that you'll be happy if only you get just one more. Friend, that's a huge lie from hell. The heart is a bottomless pit that will not be satisfied by things. The more you have, the more you want. You know the grass is always greener across the fence. The advertising industry thrives on making your heart discontent. Everything out there is better than what you have. You will be okay if only you buy something new out there. That's a fat big lie. What does St. Paul say to the Christians in Philippi? I have learned to be content in all circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Friend, it will take the power of God to grow contentment in our heart. Finally, you will rejoice if you sincerely believe that God will meet your needs no matter what. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for daily bread. Give us his dear daily bread. Whatever needs you have, God knows them and is committed to taking care of you. And Paul says to encourage our hearts and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. 
Yes, God will meet your and my needs. Anxiety about tomorrow is the biggest blow to contentment and joy. Yesterday, friend, is gone, and tomorrow is said to be forever. Live today, today, and let God worry about tomorrow on your behalf. That is a source of joy for you. And as I come to the end of this time together, allow me a moment to underline my message today. Firstly, life is full of anxiety, mainly because of the past and the unknown future and human greed. This anxiety is unhelpful and only leads to gross unhappiness and lack of joy. You know we can do better with God's help. Secondly, we are called to joy and rejoicing in our walk of faith. The real source of joy is learning to trust God with every detail of my life. Thirdly, what I allow to occupy my mind will determine whether I live a life of joy or become miserable. If I fill my mind with the failures and regrets of yesterday and anger and revenge, I will most certainly be without joy. Fourthly and finally, hiding the word of God in your heart will be the true source of joy. The word of God will replace heart and pain and repair and heal my heart and allow me to grow the attitude of joy. The Spirit of God will cause my heart to rejoice. So friend, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. This brings us to the end of our time together. We've been listening to Hope for Tomorrow with me, Geoffrey Jenga. Today, urging us to rejoice always. God willing, we shall be together again next Sunday. In the meantime, should you want to get in touch with me, I'm on 0722-839074. Again, 0722-839074. Goodbye and God bless.